A lot of my biggest cheerleaders are here, and so I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity. Uh, Bible Baptist is a supporter of both my family and of the ministry of Mount Lucan. And so we're, we're, this is a real joy for me to be with you today. Uh, thanks for praying for the ministry. The team members are in the area for the next two weeks uh, before they get to go home on their break. They're in a local church uh, even this morning. We are doing some local chapels in the area. Uh, we have a, a concert uh, on December 8th. The team members are doing a winter concert out at Mount Lucan. There are a number of things uh, that they're busy with before they get to go spend time with their families. So thank you for praying for the team and the ministry. Also, thank you uh, for praying for my wife, Tricia, as she recovers from her reconstructive hip surgery. Things are right on pace, just not as fast as she wants them to be. But uh, appreciate your prayers as she recovers from, from that. This morning, we're going to be looking at John, actually, the uh, chapter 3 and 4. If you want to look there in the scriptures while you're doing that, a lot of times in life, the decisions that we make are based on a cost-benefit analysis. And I don't just mean finances, but, but we weigh the pros and the cons, right? We, we look at the, what it's going to cost us and what the benefits are. We just finished Thanksgiving, so what do we immediately start thinking about, right? Christmas is coming, and so everybody's thinking about decorations and purchasing gifts and the planning and all the things that go into that. And even as we go to buy presents, we have to make a cost-benefit analysis. Is this really worth it, uh, the cost that I'm going to spend in order to get a benefit out of giving that gift? And we weigh those decisions out. We do the same thing when we choose the clothes that we wear in a given day. Uh, what's the cost of those clothes to the benefit that I'm going to get from wearing it? We, we pick houses and things based on cost benefit. That's a beautiful house, but is the cost really worth it? Uh, we, we ask ourselves those questions. Relationships that we enter often are gauged based on a cost benefit. And is, is it worth the time I'm going to have to invest in this person? Am I going to get the, the benefit from it? This, this whole concept of cost-benefit analysis probably first came to me when I was a high school student. I, I became aware of this. I, I got a summer job to help me finance my college education. I, I decided as a young man, I, I wanted to be a school teacher and a coach. That, that was what my aspirations were. And that's impossible to carry out without a, an education. You, you have to go to college if you're going to teach students, and, and math was my area, and especially if you're going to teach them some of those mathematical concepts. So I go to this summer job, and I, it's, it's called Modern Door Corporation. It was a door factory, and I met all kinds of interesting characters when I entered into Modern Door, uh, the factory there. One particular individual's name it was, was Jamie McCormick, Jamie McCormick. And uh, it was interesting, Jamie and I came from very different backgrounds. And as we got to working together and talking, it came up that I was planning to go to school, planning to go to college. And he said these words, I'll never forget them, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I thought, you know, most people that I had been sharing this ambition with were, were very supportive of it. They thought that was a good use of my life and time and energy. And Jamie looked me right in the eye and shot that whole thing down. And I then asked the question, well, why do you think this is dumb? I'm 17 years old. I'm just eyes wide open walking into the world. And Jamie says, let me show you something. He's, he's older than I am, probably four or five years. And we go out and look in the window at the parking lot, and he has a brand new truck parked out there. And he said, you see that? Instead of me wasting money on a college education, I was able to purchase this brand new truck. And it, and it caused me to pause. It was very nice. Uh, it was... Um, 
everything that, that somebody that wanted a truck would, would want right there. And I actually went home and, and I talked to my, my dad, I'll never forget, I said, man, for the first time ever, somebody told me it was not very smart for me to pursue uh, this, that, that I could have all these things. And I'll never forget what my dad said. He said, Jimmy, you, you need to look beyond the truck. That is a really, really nice truck. But, but you need to look beyond that truck. Um, there is benefit to working in that door factory. And there's cost to it. And there's cost and benefit to what you're pursuing as well. You just need to think carefully and you need to look beyond the truck. And, and so as I think about the idea or the concept of following Christ, there is a cost and there is a benefit that are attached to those, that, that concept of following Christ. Now, what I want to do today is I want to follow the path of a couple followers of Christ and I want us to each think about our individual paths that we're taking as we consider following Christ. Because there are costs and there are benefits. And as hopefully as we analyze these examples, and there are many more that we could look at, but as we analyze two today, I trust it will be encouragement to your heart and a challenge just to think about your path of following Christ. Now, getting into the message, I decided to Google the word followership. It's not a word that we use often. Leadership has a whole lot more hits. 37,500,000 hits when you type in leadership. And we all admire leaders. In fact, if we were going to go for training, leadership training is kind of a, a worthy thing to follow. Meanwhile, followership isn't as popular, 50 times more hits are on leadership than followership, but yet Jesus calls us to be followers. And so mastering the concept of following is much more important than mastering the concept of leading if we really look at the way that Jesus taught. Well, as you turn in your Bible to John chapter 3, the first character that we want to follow the path of discipleship is a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is somebody that uh, doesn't show up a whole lot in scripture. There are a couple other references to him outside of this particular passage, but in John chapter 3, I want to look at just the first two verses with you. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. So we don't have a ton on Nicodemus, and I might even be speculating just a bit But here is some things that I believe we can understand from the like of Nicodemus. He was a highly intelligent individual. For him to be a member of the Pharisees, it means that he had been educated in the finest systems that were available, and he had done well. He had excelled in his studies for him to be in the position that he was. His intelligence level would have been high, he would have been a very well-respected individual as a teacher of the law who had been well-versed in these things. People looked up to him. He was not just a religious leader, but a community leader as well. Admired. People would have looked at him with great respect. Additionally, his knowledge of scripture and the Jewish law and traditions would have been off the charts. It is said that probably Nicodemus had the first five books of the law memorized by the time that he was age 12. That was what was traditional for these people that had been selected and trained from the very beginning. And the first five books of the Bible memorized, we shake our heads if we have to memorize one verse 
we have a hard time remembering it a week later, and yet this Nicodemus, he would have heard the teaching of the law constantly. His exposure to it would have been unbelievable. And so we see him coming to Jesus. Now, in addition to, to just this information about him, he would have observed all the miracles and teaching of Jesus, and he notes his authority. He, he speaks up and says, man, I am looking at what you're doing. You aren't a teacher like everybody else. You are from God. He notes that. He recognizes it and makes a point of it. He also didn't just notice the power and authority that he was teaching with and the miracles that he was doing. He notices the love and compassion that Jesus is doing with it. That's what really set him apart. Everybody could quote the law, but Jesus taught it with love and compassion. The miracles that he did demonstrated love and compassion, and that is one of the things that caught Nicodemus off guard and caused him to, to meet up with Jesus. So we're pretty certain from this that, that Nicodemus was not just somebody that was sitting in the pew in the synagogue, but he was admiring Jesus Christ. He, he was full of admiration and watching carefully. Now, we also notice that he decided to come and meet Jesus at night. And you wonder, why did he go at night? Nicodemus goes at night, presumably because he didn't want to go during the day. He didn't want people knowing about this. So this was a secret meeting that Jesus had set up because he was a little bit nervous about his reputation. You see, he was well-respected. And so to go at night, then he didn't have to be so upfront about it. He could be a little more discreet and follow from afar rather than closely. Well, as we look at Nicodemus, that, that's the best that we can do on a biography of him because we don't get a lot. But a couple things that I want to point out to you that Nicodemus recognized once he starts down this path, he realizes that following Jesus always costs something. Now, in Nicodemus' case, it could have cost him his job. Because the farther that this went along, the more questions that the Pharisees had for Jesus, the more they realized he was turning a lot of the things that they were saying upside down. That was a possible result of following. We also see that Nicodemus realizes that following Jesus would potentially cost him some ridicule. He could get made fun of. He could not be esteemed, his, his position, his reputation was at stake if he were to connect with Jesus Christ. So following Jesus always costs something. And the companion concept to following is that of forsaking. If you follow something, you have to forsake something else. You can't follow without forsaking. There's a cost benefit. It's interesting in Matthew 19, 27, Peter, who was one of the closest followers of Jesus Christ, asked him, I'm going to paraphrase this, hey, Jesus, we have forsaken all to follow you. Now, what are we going to get for it? That was Peter's question, that cost benefit analysis. But following Jesus always costs something. I would ask you this question as we proceed in our message. What is following Jesus costing you? Because if it's not costing you anything, what is really happening in the, in the path that you're taking? Following Jesus costs something, and Nicodemus realizes it as he meets with him. 
You see, based on the, the claims that Jesus had just made in John chapter one, Jesus is either a total lunatic or he is the Lord, Messiah, Savior, God overall. It's one of those two. It can't be something in between. Nicodemus is realizing this because these are powerful, strong claims and a lot of people are taking exception to those. And so Nicodemus is realizing, hey, it's either one or the other, muddling around in the middle will not be acceptable when it comes to following Jesus. Well, a couple other things as we make some kind of a transformation, following is going to cost something, but believing in Jesus is not just mental assent to his existence. And it's not even just admiration. There are lots of people who will mentally assent during this season that, yeah, Christmas is about Jesus being born. That's a wonderful baseline understanding or knowledge of what's going on. But believing in Jesus is not just mental assent to this concept. A life change is what is required and demanded. You see, If you go on in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus says those flattering admiration words to Jesus, what is his answer? Except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't say, oh, thanks, Nicodemus, appreciate those nice words. Thanks for recognizing the power of my miracles, the power and authority of my teaching, the love and compassion that I have. He does not do that with Nicodemus. He says, Except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, new birth is the concept that Nicodemus was having a hard time with. For those of you that have children, the new birth thing is, a, is, is, is an amazing setting. I've, I've, I've witnessed four of them without going into all the details. It's, it's, it's a really neat thing. Um, but, but one thing I notice about it, new birth We didn't just have the child and then celebrate and rejoice and then that was the end of it. The new birth radically changed my life to this very day. It still does. Any of you that have children recognize and understand new birth is not a one-day event where we have this big celebration and then go on to living our lives the way that we did before. Soon as that child is born, life is radically transformed forever. And that is why new birth is what Nicodemus is being presented with from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want a radical transformation that's going to change your life forever. And that's what following Jesus is all about. To a guy who had heard the truth all his life and to a guy who knew it better than probably anybody else, he hadn't taken that next step of radical transformation in following Jesus. So I want to encourage us and think through this thing. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This concept is supported all throughout scripture that your life needs to have a radical transformation if you are going to be a true follower of Jesus. And Nicodemus learns it in a powerful way as we look in John chapter 3. You know, there's only one thing that's more costly than following Christ. It's not following him. That's the only thing more costly. Not following Christ. Now, if we continue to track Nicodemus, we find that he made some changes in his life. And at the very end, we recognize that he and Joseph of Arimathea were the ones who made sure that the body of Christ was taken care of. He continued to follow. We don't have all the blanks filled in for him, but we recognize that his life was transformed and changed. You know the chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus. 
you repeat that line several times, but at the end it says, no turning back. No turning back. You see, a lot of people want to experiment with Jesus. You, you've heard of, uh, you know, got milk? Let, let's try milk. If we like it, we'll drink it. If we don't, we'll set it aside. People experiment with things all the time, and if it doesn't work out the way that they hoped immediately, then they discard it and they try the next thing. Jesus is not something to be experimented with and tried out, and, and Jesus is saying, hey, there's some costs. There's no doubt about it. You will experience some difficulty in this life. The promises are all throughout, but the Benefits far outweigh the costs. Look beyond the truck is the saying that keeps coming to my mind. Look beyond the temporal circumstances of your life that are trying and difficult and you can't understand and you can't make them fit into your thinking. Look beyond that and look to Jesus. Don't try him out and say, eh, it's not working. I'm looking around and it's not working for anybody else and therefore... I'll try something else today. Don't experiment with Jesus. Follow him with all your heart, soul, and mind. Well, Nicodemus is one character that we follow. In the next chapter, John chapter 4, we find another character who is a potential follower of Christ. This potential follower of Christ couldn't be more different from Nicodemus if she tried it's, the contrast is startling, and I don't think it's accidental in any way, shape, or form as the scriptures put these two in uh, succeeding chapters. In John chapter 4, we meet a Samaritan woman. She might be better known as the woman at the well. And we could go through some of these things. The, the Samaritan woman, we don't have a huge biography on either. But in these verses, we'll start in verse 7 of John chapter 4 and read a little bit about her. It says in John chapter 4, verse 7, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons, his flocks, and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you know you now have is your husband, is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. And Jesus goes on in the rest of these verses and then breaks down for her the truth about who he is. So if we look at this Samaritan woman, we find a few things. She was considered racially inferior as a Samaritan. I don't know how well you know the background, but basically Samaritans had intermarried, which was forbidden by Jewish law. They had married Gentiles or heathens, and so the Jewish people looked at them as racially inferior. Racial tensions <laughs> occurred long before 2017, and so these same 
feelings of inferiority and hatred were cast on this woman. Without going into great detail, she was also considered inferior because she was simply a woman. In those days, women did not have any standing compared to a man. And so as a Samaritan woman, she would have been far below the status that would have been expected. She also would have been considered morally inferior. When you have five husbands and working on your sixth, Jewish law would not have given a thumbs up to her on the way that she was conducting her life. She would have been looked down upon. And she was also confused theologically. She had a lot of religious ideas. Samaritans, um, because of their intermarriage, they also brought in all the culture and all the religious ideas that would not have lined up with what the first five books of the law would have stated. And so we find on the two spectrums, as far apart as possible, Nicodemus and the unnamed Samaritan. They don't even give her a name. <laughs> That's how low on the totem pole she was. But it's interesting as we follow along, you read later here in John chapter 4, she understood that there was a Messiah coming. So although she was confused, she had one thing right. There is a Messiah that's coming. She just didn't know that she was talking to him at that moment. So let's take a look for just a minute at this path. Drastically different than someone who's been exposed to truth and, and, and had studied it extensively. We look at this lady and we realize while Jesus had a physical need, this woman had a spiritual need. She didn't know it. She didn't even recognize that she had a spiritual need, yet Jesus will expose this. What we find is the woman asked for water. Jesus explains about this water that will never make her thirsty again. Wouldn't that be great? We take one drink of water and we never have to go get one again. We're, we're, we're all set. That was what her mindset was, and yet Jesus explains to her, you know, this, this is a different kind of a water that I'm talking about. What she is understanding is, I need water. Jesus gives her the law instead. As soon as she asks him for this water, we would expect Jesus to say, hey, this is the truth. I'm the Messiah. Receive me as your Savior. Ask forgiveness of your sins, and, 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 and you can be saved. He doesn't do that. She didn't know that she had anything wrong with her. He exposes her to the law. He asks her about her husband and shows that the life that she has lived means she needs something. You know, Jesus used this same strategy in Mark chapter 10. When he met with the rich young ruler, Jesus, the rich young ruler came up and said, sir, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus say to him? Keep the commandments. And he said, well, I have since my youth. And he goes through commandments and says, he's done this. And does Jesus applaud him and tell him, good job? What does Jesus do? He says, go, sell all that you have, come and follow me exposing him as breaking the first commandment, saying, having no other gods before me, I, I can't do that. All the riches that I have, he walks away because he's sad. He can't do that, and he gets exposed. The law is the schoolmaster that teaches us that we need a savior. That's the, that's the reason that the law is in place. If you are going around spending all your time trying to keep the Ten Commandments, you will be frustrated. Now, that doesn't mean we don't obey, but we realize in our own strength, we are going to fall short. The Ten Commandments were given so that you know you need a Savior. You need to follow Christ who can save you from your sins and restore you to a relationship with the Lord. That's what 
the exposure of the law does. And that's what was done in the life of this Samaritan woman. She asked for the water. Jesus gave her the law to expose her need. She also realizes that association with Jesus Christ is gonna mean a lifestyle change. Just like Nicodemus realized it, she realized it. Now it was different. Nicodemus' path was different than the Samaritan woman's path, but she also realized association would drastically change her life. Her knowledge and the understanding convinced her of who he was. We go on in John chapter 4, and we read that this woman did this. It says in verse 27, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. You know why they're surprised? Because this woman was so far underneath him, they couldn't believe it. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then it goes on and say, many of these Samaritans came to Christ as a result of the testimony of this Samaritan woman. One thing to think about, convinced people convince others, right? What is a great strategy in marketing? Find a satisfied customer and get them up there and let them sell the product by telling others how wonderful it is, how it affected them in positive ways. Convince people, convince others. The Samaritan woman did it. Are we convincing others? Are we convinced so much that we're convincing others? Here's another thought that comes as I consider the Samaritan woman is commitment to Christ, not perfection, is the key to following. Commitment to Christ is what the Samaritan woman had. She, she had lost perfection a long time ago. Her ability to live up to the standard of the law, she'd blown it five husbands back. And yet, she can have an authentic relationship following Christ because she became committed to it. Once the truth had sunk in, and she alters her lifestyle and completely sells out for Christ, she can follow. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people and some of them are hesitant about following Christ because of the, the word hypocrite. They're, they're so afraid of being a hypocrite. My answer to them is, hey, it's no problem. There's room for one more hypocrite to join the followers of Christ. There's plenty of room. In a sense, all of us are that, right? If we go to our past and we spend enough time dwelling on our failures and our mistakes and our shortcomings, we would all say, I'm not, I'm not worthy to follow Christ. I'm, 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 not, I'm not capable of this. But if we do as the Samaritan woman and become so convinced that Jesus is who he says, and that he can do the transforming in my life that can only take place by his touch, then it can make a difference. Don't get so caught up in perfection that you don't make a commitment. See, a lot of people fear commitment because they think if I make this commitment and I fail at some point, I don't want to be a liar, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Oh no. See, following Christ is all in, sell out, no going back, no turning back. The Bible tells us all about the forgiveness that we can have from our mistakes. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible talks about righteous people falling down and getting back up. The body of Christ has been constructed to encourage and help and build you up as you go through your path of following Christ. The Samaritan woman 
could have easily said, hey, I've made so many mistakes. I can't go to town. Who's going to listen to me? I'm not credible. I, you know what? She became so convinced she was running and telling and everybody was following her. They, they believed her. If she's credible enough, certainly you and I can be credible enough to convince others to follow Christ. Well, cost-benefit analysis. We, we started out there and we thought about that. Following Christ has a cost-benefit analysis that goes with it. It's not necessarily financial. If you look at it financially, you'll probably try something else. It's not even immediate. Deciding to follow Christ, your circumstances will not immediately change where now everything is wonderful. But I can assure you, the answer that Jesus gave to Peter in Matthew chapter 19, when he asked the question, we have forsaken all, now what's in it for us? Jesus looked at him and said, for everything that it costs you, you will recognize 100-fold. Now, I don't know what exactly that means. I don't know that you'll all have cash or gold piled up as a result. I think Jesus is more than capable of making that promise, ones that will cause all of us to say, hey, the cost-benefit, it wasn't even close. 100 times, a hundred times greater is, is the way that it's described in Matthew chapter 19 to Peter. There are a lot more followers of Christ in the Gospels that you can follow. Today we look at two. We look at Nicodemus, we look at the woman at the well. Probably we can identify to some degree with either or both as we follow Christ. You have a path that you're on following Christ. I trust that some of these things are an encouragement and a challenge to your life that you would follow him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Lord, we rejoice and praise you that your truth is available to us. Following you is the greatest privilege that any of us could ever have in this life. My prayer is that we, as we look at these two characters from the scripture, that we would be challenged and encouraged to take truth and to apply it to our lives in meaningful ways. Following you is a no turning back proposition. And I pray that we would do that with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.